How am I taking so long? Okay, recording is on. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 309, our course on urban church planting. This is our second lecture for this week. Um, and I hope um, uh, you can hear me fine. I'm just uh, using a different uh, mic today. And uh, if there's any problems, please just let me know on the chat. Let's take a moment to pray and we get started. May I request somebody to please pray with us and then we will start. Can somebody just pray with the plants? Anyone? Right. right, Abraham, would you like to pray? Anybody else? Asa, please, can you hear me? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Please, let's pray. Precious Father, we thank you this morning. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity you've given us to hear your word and to know more of you. Father, we commit today's meeting onto your hands. That, Father, by the time we are done today, Father, we will understand the principles of church planting. That not only are we going to have the skills to plant churches, but we are going to do that which pleases you, that which brings you glory, and that which brings you honor. Father, we thank you for our hearts and minds are open to receive your word. That every word that will come from our pastor will minister grace unto us. That the grace will be abundant for us to step out and do what is necessary and what is pleasing to you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, so before we move forward here, um, I hope yeah, you had some time to just, you know, think about practical things we were talking yesterday. Any questions, any thoughts that came up after the class that you want to ask before we get into the uh, new thoughts today? Anybody has any questions? Okay, let's go to where we paused yesterday. Uh, we pick up from there and move ahead. I'm just going to share the PDF with us. So we're talking about the practical aspects that go into pioneering a local church. Uh, yesterday we emphasized on the uh, church planting core team, the importance of having a good uh, team together. Uh, we talked about preparing from a distance, uh, what can be done, you know, from if you're away, if you're in a different location from the place where you want to plant the church, you can actually take some time to prepare from a distance. Then, of course, you relocate, you get on site, you get into the city or the region where God wants you to plant or pioneer the work. Uh, we talked a little bit about planning for the finances. You could work for some time, and that's perfectly fine. You don't have to, you know, um, uh, rule that out. Uh, you could be supported by your sending church. That's great if that happens. I uh, did just plan and prepare for your personal needs. Um, also look at some of the uh, legal regulatory matters. We started talking about surveying the city. That is, just trying to get a feel of, you know, how the city is, what's going on in the city. Uh, we took a little bit of time yesterday uh, to look at Paul, how uh, what he did at uh, Philippi, and also what he did at Athens. And these are good, you know, case studies. Uh, examples that we can learn from that Paul, you know, in those days they didn't have the tools, they didn't have all the resources that which we have today. So basically, they had to go into the city and then, you know, try to understand what's going on and just be led by God uh, as they uh, established and planted churches city after city. And so it was very, very interesting for us to look at how Paul went about. You know, he took time to understand the city. He went around Philippi and then he found out there was a prayer meeting happening by the riverside. And he goes, he and his team, they go there and then they share about Jesus and God opens up the heart of Lydia and she welcomes them. Uh, at Athens, Paul is there alone. 
he just goes around the city, he goes to the synagogue, he goes to the marketplace, he's engaging in conversation, and then God opens a wonderful door for him um, at, uh, uh, to stand before the Aeropagus, uh, the, to the leaders, you can say the intellectual leaders of Athens, and Paul speaks to them about Jesus. Uh, and he uses, you know, his, his observations as part of his communication. Uh, so we had a little bit of discussion on that yesterday. And then uh, people, uh, some people in the Aeropagus also come to Christ. So uh, beautiful examples of how, you know, take time to survey the city, understand what's going on. Uh, we, you know, the, God will give us ideas. Um, the next thing, of course, we want to do is to select the launch area. You see... A city is huge, typically, right? It's, it's, it's a vast area, um, and there are possibly millions of people in the city. Uh, and so um, you need to think about where do you want to start the church? Where do you want to plant the church or the, the, the Christian ministry that you're doing? Where do you want to do it? And these are just some pointers. Of course, we are, all of us, each one of us have to be led by God. But here are some practical things you can think about as you are praying. Um, you want to identify the area in which you're going to do the church plant. Um, and uh, sometimes you may know even before you come into the city, because if you're doing a survey of the city, you will know that, okay, here, this is the area where, you know, the people I want to reach are. And so, and that would be uh, an easy way to locate where you're going to start the church. Uh, sometimes God will direct you specifically to go, go to that place and start the work. Um, and so, uh, from your launch area, of course, you're going to reach the whole city. You're not going to tell, uh, exclude anybody. People are always welcome and they can come to the, the work from anywhere. Or sometimes you may have multiple congregations. And that's also fine. Um, but then when you're look, thinking about the launch area, some of the things you want, we want to think about is uh, we want to be sensitive to what God is already doing in the city. So don't do something that would adversely affect other churches. Uh, pick an area that does not already have a church like the one you're planting, right? So that means don't, if, example, if you're a spiritual church, you know, so the, the, don't go right, go right next to another spiritual church and then, you know, in the same language and so on and so forth. That may cause, you know, confusion unnecessarily. So try to be in a place where, you know, there's not a similar church. Uh, you know, there could be, example, a church in a different language. So maybe you're, you're, you're going to be ministering to people who speak English. Maybe there's a local church or the churches who are ministering to people in different languages. Okay, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, because there's a difference. Uh, and you're not going to overlap in the kinds of people you are serving. Uh, but, uh, you know, try to be in a place where you're not interfering with the work that uh, another church is already doing. Uh, something we already mentioned uh, uh, earlier is, uh, you know, try to establish good relations with pastors and leaders of churches and organizations that are already doing some work. You know, be friends with them. Uh, of course, you can't be friends with everybody, but, you know, whomever you can go, uh, let them know that you come there not to compete with them or take away from what God has already been doing. Right? So you kind of get rid of any fear of competition or sheep stealing and so on. You know, one of the things that we did um, uh, from early on is that during in, in our services, we make a simple statement like, you know, when we welcome new people and say, okay, is anybody with us for the first time? So some people might identify themselves. Then we always, uh, we've, we've been doing this from, the early days, we always say, if you are already part of a church in our city uh, that teaches the word of God, we encourage you to remain faithful there. Uh, but if you're looking for a home church, then please come back, visit us, and uh, see if this is where God wants you to be planted. So that way, you're making it clear that people need to be faithful to their own, you know, local congregations. Unless you know they're looking for a church, maybe they are new to the city, they are just moved into the city or maybe they've had to relocate within the city, so they have to leave their previous, um, leave their local church to find another church, so they have some valid reasons and so on. But otherwise, you're encouraging people to stay faithful. And so a simple thing like that, 
uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it is encouraging people to remain faithful to their own congregations, but also it kind of, when, when other pastors know that you're doing that, they also feel comfortable that, you know, uh, you're not there to, to take people away from other churches and so on. So, um, you know, the launch area uh, is, uh, is, is a place where you are close to your target audience. So uh, you want to launch, you want to start off your work in a place where uh, the, your target audience, the, the main people that you're trying to reach, have, can find it accessible. They have easy access to it. Right? So, uh, example, if you are, you know, if your uh, your target audience is, um, uh, you know, uh, young, uh, say college students, this is this is an example. You, you're you're starting a ministry that is going to serve mainly college students. Of course, you want to be somewhere close to where these college students you know, are uh, available. You know, so. Uh, they should know that you're there and they should be, have easy access. So if you go and start a church way, way far away where the college students cannot come, they don't have access, they can't drive there or they can't take transport there, transportation there, then, you know, you, you may have a genuine call with God, but you're, you're positioned yourself in a very difficult place and that's difficult for the college students to access or for even you to reach them. So that's why the selecting the launch area. Uh, we have to do it very carefully uh, put yourself cl as close as possible to uh, the people you're trying to reach. Uh, they should, it should be accessible. Now, we know that in today, uh, today's uh, cities, um, you know, people have access to transportation, public transportation and so on and so forth. So many parts of the city are quite well connected. But think also about time, you know, how much time people will be spending coming and going, because that's part of their personal equation. They're thinking, you know, how much time will it take for me to go uh, to my place where I'm going to meet with others and fellowship with others. So uh, select your launch area carefully and then understand what's going on around your launch area. You know, how far are you from schools and colleges and other places of interest that you would be where you could evangelize, where you could meet new people. You know, so understand the area around it, because then you will begin to plan out your strategies uh, based on that. Okay. Number 10 is the preparation phase. So chapter 10. Um, so here, what you want to do is you want to prepare for the launch. That means before you start your, say, your church services, you want to get yourself ready to do that. Now, there is uh, no set time uh, for how long this pre-launch period should be. Uh, you know, some people take three months, some people take six months, some people even take two years uh, that, that I'm aware of. Now, that's okay. You know, it's, it's entirely up to you. But what I would encourage is start as soon as possible. I don't delay. Because the longer you delay, you could get distracted, you could become discouraged, you could, you know, uh, sometimes give up on the vision entirely. So uh, keep this preparation phase meaningful, purposeful, and only for as long as it really is helping you prepare to launch. So what would you do during the preparation phase? So you, the core team, you know, you, you, the core team needs to meet regularly. So you're getting together uh, for times of prayer, times of worship. Um, you're getting, uh, you know, you're getting uh, yourself organized. You're also becoming familiar with the city. So that's what happens during the pre-launch phase. That's a, the, the, the good team is spending time understanding and also beginning to spiritually pray and. You know, becoming strong together, praying for the people, praying for people around in the launch area where you're going to start. Uh, so that's what you're doing. And you may engage in one-on-one -on -one evangelism. That means you haven't launched yet, but people are beginning to rec know that you're there because you're meeting with them, you're talking to them. And uh, so you're, you're getting together uh, a few people to join with you in your pre-launch meeting. So it may be a 
prayer meeting inside a house or a worship service in somebody's house. So that's your pre-launch meeting. You haven't launched out in your Sunday service officially yet, but in a pre-launch meeting, you might be inviting some people that you're connecting with, getting them to come. You're also spending a lot of time in worship, prayer, and intercession, doing this stuff. So you're doing the spiritual side of the church plant. You're beginning to pray over that region, that part of the city. You're beginning to pray maybe for individuals, individual families that you've started to meet. Um, so you're engaging mainly in worship, prayer, and intercession during the pre-launch session. You're getting yourself ready to uh, get started. Uh, part of this, like I mentioned earlier, is you, you know your primary target audience. That means you are, as a church, you're going to focus on these kinds of people. So for example, at, at APC, we, our focus is um, English-speaking professionals. Right? So that's kind of where we are focused on. So we are, our services in, in, are in English, and we are ministering to an urban crowd, and we are ministering to urban professionals. Uh, which could be you know young professionals as well as as well as young married professionals but then everybody else is also welcome so of course there are children there are youth and there are older people as well but the core that's the main target audience so a lot of what you do will be in that direction towards them right that's your primary target audience so you understand your target audience understand their needs uh, during your pre-launch phase you're observing them in the city and saying, hey, these are the main needs here. You're connecting with them. Uh, you know, uh, for example, when you look at Jesus, he sent his 12 disciples and then uh, during his earthly ministry, he said, you know, you focus on the Jewish people. Why, why did he tell them to do that? There was, there was a purpose of God in it, that when he came in his earthly ministry, he was focused to the lost sheep, focused on the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was the focus. After that, the gospel will then go to the ends of the earth, right? But during that three year, three or three and a half year period, he was focused on the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You also find, for example, Paul, the apostle, uh, he was called to the Gentiles, whereas Peter was called to the Jews. So again, you see a focus in, 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 in what they're called to do. That doesn't mean Paul never ministered to the Jews, or that never meant uh, Peter never ministered to the Gentiles. Of course they did. But God's primary call, primary assignment was towards those kinds of people. So, you know, God will give you certain primary uh, people to target. Uh, understand that that's the people you would be able to relate to very easily. But of course, everybody else is welcome. And, you know, God will use you beyond that as well. Uh, another thing you're doing in this uh, uh, preparation phase during your pre-launch phase is you're identifying people whom God has already prepared. So as you're taking time to just get to know the city, you'll find that God is connecting you with certain people in the city. Right? And we see this also in Matthew 10 when Jesus sent out his uh, 12 apostles, 12 disciples. He said, you know, individual city you enter, find out who is worthy? That means who welcomes you in? And then let your peace come upon that house. Right? So that means there are certain people who, who feel like God has prepared their hearts. Say, hey, please come in, you know, tell us more. And, and then they're, they're very open to you. Yeah? So you connect with them. Uh, let your peace come upon them. But if there are people who reject you, okay, just move on. Yeah? So uh, go where you're welcome. Uh, we saw the example of Lydia. And a prayer group in Philippi, you know, God had opened her heart. And so Paul knew that this was a way for them to minister in Philippi. But you also need to discern and avoid the wrong people with wrong motives and intentions, right? Sometimes people may come alongside, they may pretend they're for you, but their motive or their intent is something else. You know, maybe they want money or some other motivation. So be careful of that. Uh, avoid uh, those kinds of uh, people. Um, uh, identify your launch location, which we mentioned, where you're going to start your services. So, uh, you know, maybe it's a commercial space that you're able to rent, maybe it's a school hall you're able to rent, um, or maybe a, 
a, a seminar hall somewhere, maybe it's a banquet hall in a hotel, uh, where, you know, that, that location where you're going to start. And just make sure some basic things. It's easily accessible, it's clean, there's enough parking, you know, uh, if you need it, you can start in a home and then later move to a hall. And that's how we did it. We started off in our home, the living room of our for home, and then we moved out. Uh, if you're going to rent a place, you know, uh, make sure that you tell them, look, this is going to be used for a church, put a proper rental agreement in place, and make sure that you're not going to be a problem to neighbors. Right? Uh, so wherever you go, because there's going to be worship, there's going to be music, it shouldn't be a problem to neighbors. So these are just some basic things you think about uh, about your long launch location. I just want to share a few thoughts here from um, uh, Tim Keller, uh, Five Principles for Initiating a Church Plant in an Urban Context. Uh, he was the uh, former senior pastor of a church in New York. He says this, and so it, put it puts it very nicely. We need to live in the community, learn the community, link your ministry to the community, you need to love the community, and you need to launch in the community. And I think that this really captures essentially what you do in that pre-launch phase. You know, you're in the community, you're learning about them, you're trying to connect with them, you're loving on them, and then you're going to be able to launch in their midst, and they will begin to come. Right? So some other things, uh, just a couple, couple of more thoughts and we'll take some time for discussion, is uh, while you are thinking of your primary location, uh, identify other areas where your ministry can expand in that city. Right? So where can you do evangelism? Where should you go out if you want to reach new people? Uh, where can you disciple people? So, you know, if people you know, want to spend time with people one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you, know, you can see there are coffee shops and restaurants or you can invite them home. Uh, what are special needs that, that you might feel called to address? You know, example, there could be uh, direction or counseling or jobs or so on and so forth. That you can connect with people, you can meet special needs. You know, some of the things that uh, um, I noticed um, uh, in our city here in Bangalore is, uh, you know, when, when there are a lot of people coming into the city looking for jobs. And so if you can have something to help them find jobs, uh, it shows that, you know, so that becomes a point of uh, interaction with them. So they come looking for jobs, you're there to help them. And uh, then in the process, of course, you're going to help them find a job, you know, do whatever you can. But in the process, they also become familiar with the church community. And say, hey, here's the people who are willing to help and, uh, and so on. So there's a need, which is people are moving into the city for jobs, but then the community is there to help them but it also exposes them to the community of believers and uh, they can you know, be brought in. So like that, there could be special needs in the city that you're identifying and look at ways by which you can address those needs and they, they become points of ministry uh, and uh, reaching people. Right? Um, um, another thought here is if you don't want to do it the traditional way, which is having a church service, uh, you can even think about a house church model. That means uh, just stay in the homes of people and do house churches. Right? That's another option uh, if you want to do that. Uh, either way is fine. You, you know, each one you have to follow what God wants you to do. Uh, there are advantages of having a common gathering, a large gathering, because then this fellowship can happen. There can be a sharing of um, a lot of resources and so on. A house church model, of course, it, uh, it's more closing it, uh, but then you will need many leaders you know, to keep everything in order and have uh, house churches, many house churches. Uh, the, the way you want to do it, you, know, you have to do what the Lord needs you to do. But I just put it in here so that you know that this is also an option. It doesn't always have to be you know, a big uh, church hall or setting. Okay, I'm going to pause here to see if there are any questions. Uh, everybody is with, with me. Uh, any questions here? So far? Everyone's okay? 
All right. So what we talked about is the preparation phase, or so the pre-launch phase. So these are some things you can do. Now, I, I, uh, I know of some churches where the pre-launch phase itself was two years. So the, the team went into the city, uh, and then uh, they spent two years just in worship and prayer and uh, you know, connecting with people uh, you know, before they actually started off their uh, official Sunday services. Uh, for two years, the team was there just getting to know the city, know the people, just spending time in worship and prayer and so on. So some people do it like that. And I now I wouldn't say you, you, it has to be two years of preparation or pre-launch. No. Sometimes it could just be one month. You go in there, you know exactly where you're going to start, you get everything ready, and you get started. Now, I, I would encourage an early start so that you don't, um, uh, you know, waste too much time or you could get distracted. Right? So go in there, get settled, understand the community, understand the people, find the area where you want to start, you know your target, art, target audience, get a good place that is accessible, and then, of course, you're going to spend time in prayer, intercession, worship, and then get the work started. Right? So how do you uh, get the work started? What do you do? How do you launch? Um, so that, that's the next chapter. So what do you do? The launch. So you launch only once. Uh, hopefully you're not going to, uh, you don't have to relaunch. But there are many ways you can go about launching a church plant. You could do a simple, quiet thing, just, you know, just open up the place and say, you know, the people you've invited, you just say, hey, come on, we're just moving here. So you're just basically moving from a house to a hall. So it could be a simple and a quiet uh, launch of the church plant. Or you could have something big, you know, you could have a special event uh, that is well promoted, it's highly visible. Uh, maybe you do a music concert, maybe you do a gospel meeting, a healing service, something big that attracts crowds and attracts people. Um, so some church, some people may do it that way, some people may just do a quiet church launch, uh, church launch, church plant launch. Now either way is fine, right? Uh, you can have a series of special meetings, so you could say, okay, for the next three to five days, we're having special meetings. So your launch itself is, it starts off with a series of meetings. There could be uh, many, many other ways to launch. You know, first church service, you know, keep it very simple. Uh, so people are coming in, uh, uh, you know, uh, they want to get a feel of what is the service all about. Uh, so your first church service of the time, you can... Uh, set expectations, what can people expect if they are coming here, uh, share your vision, uh, what is this church all about, now keep everything focused on Jesus. I remember in our very first church service, that was when we started our people's church, I told so our vision is to be, and uh, I made the same vision, vision statement, you know, to be salt and light in our city, to be a voice to the nation and to the nations. So that was from the very first service, there were just about 12 people basically our own family and a couple of friends. Uh, to them, I said, no, our vision is to be salt and light in our city, uh, be a voice to our nation and to the nation. So from the very beginning, the vision was, we are going to impact our nation. We are going to impact the nations. Right? So we started off like that. The vision was very clear that our goal is uh, beyond just ourselves. Right? Uh, we even you know, talked about the ministries we would like to start, and so on. So your first church service, uh, you're, you're bringing out a vision. Uh, people should feel like they can be a part of this journey, and they can grow. They can uh, grow spiritually. They can also be connected to what is going to come. Uh, so that first church service is very important. You should think about it and do it carefully. A uh, very important is that you should have a plan for follow up. That means when people come, uh, you know, at the very basic level, uh, they should feel welcomed. You welcome them in and uh, you interact with them. And, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very uh, non threatening way, you take the name and number or contact information so that you can call them back. 
you know, and uh, reach out to them and invite them back if they have, uh, if they're, you know, if they're interested, of course. Uh, see if they have any specific needs uh, or connect them to a small group where they can meet with other people. So there's got to be this follow-up plan, and that follow-up plan should be happening every service. So whenever new people come, uh, you try to get their information, and uh, uh, then you follow up with them, you invite them back. Now, some people may come out of curiosity. Uh, they don't have an intent in, uh, to keep coming back. So then that's okay, that's fine. They just wanted to see what's happening. But there are some people looking for a church, or they're looking for what you are going, you know, going to do. So you need to be able to connect back to them, welcome them back, and um, you know, connect them to what you're doing. So this follow-up plan must be very important. Otherwise, you're putting all the effort into launching, uh, you're inviting people, but then you don't know how to follow up with them. You don't know how to invite them back uh, if you don't have their contact information. Right? So, but do that in a very nice way. Uh, without, they shouldn't feel threatened, or they shouldn't feel that uh, all you want is their contact information. Right? So uh, do it in a very nice way, and uh, in a way that they are comfortable, uh, make them feel welcome, and uh, reach out to them. Okay? So. Any questions here so far? Everyone's with me? Okay, uh, just simple things. So, um, okay, so let's uh, get into the next chapter, which is strategies for, I'll just introduce this chapter, but you can continue it next week. Um, strategies for urban evangelism. So now that you've launched, you've got started, um, we, we need to think of ways by which we can continue to reach out into the city, to the communities around us. Right? So we need strategies. We need to think about ways. How are we going to reach people? Right? So, when you think about strategies, there's, there's, there's got to be some, of course, some guiding principles. Uh, we want to keep our methods wholesome. That means it's got to be spirit-led. The Holy Spirit's got to lead us. But we also want to be legal and ethical. That means don't do something that's illegal or unethical. Don't infringe on... Uh, uh, on sp into spaces that you're not supposed to be going. Uh, so, you know, uh, keep keep our whole approach wholesome. Right? People should not look at our uh, the way we are evangelizing and and uh, and point fingers at us and say, look, we, we are doing something wrong. Right? So, keep keep this in mind. Be spirit led. Be legal. Be ethical. Right? Um, we need to step into people's world. That means we need to go where they are. How can we enter their world? Right? How can we uh, go before them and uh, give them an invitation or even let them know that what we are offering to them? Right? So we need to think of those ways. How can we go before people? Also, uh, when we are thinking about uh, 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 strategies for evangelism, uh, we need to be culturally sensitive and culturally relevant. That means uh, work within the cultural context. Right? Uh, so what may work in one place may not be necessarily suitable for a different place. So think about the culture, the, the way people will understand what you're doing, right? because uh, some actions could be misinterpreted uh, incorrectly uh, or wrongly. So being sensitive to that culture, especially if you're working cross-culturally or if you're coming in from a different culture, uh, be sensitive to the way people would relate. Right? So keep these things in mind as we are you know, thinking about um, uh, strategies. So we're going to read one passage of scripture and then we'll just discuss a, 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 a question and then we'll wrap up for today. Let's turn in our Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And uh, we will read about what the Apostle Paul says about how he went about his apostolic ministry. 
of an event about planting churches and overseeing these churches and serving the people. What was, you know, what was behind that? Uh, he shares that with us in 1 Corinthians 9, 16 to 23. Uh, could one of us, could somebody read that out for us? Thank you. All right, so um, let's look at you know what the Apostle Paul is saying here about how he was uh, preaching the gospel. Right? Verse 19, he says, Though I am free, I made myself a servant to all. So that was his situation. He's free, but he choosing, he's choosing, verse 19, to to move into a different stages, so to speak, in order to bring the gospel to people. And then he says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew, to those who are under the law, as under the law. Verse 21, those who are outside the law, I became as outside the law, but not without the law of God. Verse 22, to the weak, I became like a weak. End of verse 22, I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. What, what, essentially, what Paul is essentially saying is, he got into people's worlds, right? To the Jew, he became like that. To the weak, he became like that. To those outside the law, he became like that. He got into their world so that he could connect with them, right? So part of our strategy is, how do we enter into people's worlds? That means where they are, where they are spending time, where they are living life and where they are, you know, thinking through things. How can we get in there so that we can bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to them? So that's what we need to do, like find out strategies, find out ways by which we can step into other people's words. So uh, I just wanted to, you know, I want us to just think about what could keep us from entering into people's worlds. So suppose you're in a city. Can you know, imagine uh, you're in a city like uh, Bangalore, and um, uh, you, you, you know, you, you're starting a ministry of church in a particular area, and then you see that, hey, around me, there are certain kinds of people. So example, example. Suppose there is, and I'm talking about an urban context. Suppose there are young people who are into drugs, who have um, just uh, messed up their lives, basically. You know? And they're all in their early 20s and uh, dropped out of their education or in some way. They're not really, and then they're into drugs and so on. Now here you are, this young pastor. Uh, you know, you you, you want to you know be this holy vessel unto God. How can you step into their world to reach them? Or another question we could ask is, what would keep us from entering into their worlds to reach them with the gospel? 
Just want to hear your thoughts. So there are two questions. What would keep us from entering into their worlds? And two, how can we enter into their world? What are some strategies to get into their world? So you're, you're, you're starting a church, but right around there's a whole community of young people who are into drugs and doing all those kinds of things. You know, uh, uh, I don't know if you understand these terms, like, but they would say they're skinheads, they're deadheads, um, they've got all kinds of things going on. How can you step into their world? What would you, what would you say? What are some thoughts? How would we reach them? Anybody? Pastor, can I say? Go ahead. Uh, just like what we read in the passage where Paul is saying, uh, you know, though I'm free, yet I made myself a servant. And he said, to the Jews, I became as a Jew to those without law as without law. So what he means is he, he's identifying with them. So he's moving into them, keeping himself free. He is uh, not feeling bound, but that he is becoming a part of them, uh, rooted in his identity in Christ, in order to be uh, touching these lives. We cannot just you know keep ourselves separate from them completely, thinking that we are not part of them. They are... Uh, you know, not the people who can impact us negatively or something, but uh, knowing ourselves, who we are in Christ and uh, uh, being rooted in the word and truth of God, we can touch these lives impactfully uh, for a time. If we need to befriend them, if we want to be part of them, spending time with them, organizing some kind of uh, personal meetings with them, what we've learned in lifestyle evangelism in our first year, like, we can call them for a coffee, have a word with them, or you know, be in touch with them on phone calls and find out what's going in their lives and mm -hmm. uh, try to start a conversation, find out how we can be impacting them mm -hmm. by the word that God has given and the power of the gospel that God has given us. So that is what came to my mind. Thank you so much. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you. So you know, we need to be able to step into this world. So, you know, around you, there's a community. So I remember when I was in, living in, 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 in um, Cleveland, Ohio, I was a student there for some time. And right where I was living, there was an area called Coventry. And there was a big cafe there. And I would say basically that whole area was full of these kinds of people. They were all wear these black jackets. They would have all these chains hanging. They would be pierced in so many places, all these things here. Most of them had their, you know, head shaven and um, all these piercings, tattoos everywhere, always wearing black all the time. And that, that place was filled with these people. And, and, and a lot of them were all onto drugs and so on and so forth. You know, so it's a real thing. You know, you're seeing this whole community of young people whose lives are like this. Now, how do we reach them? So we need to be able to, I'm never saying, like, you know, we need to go in there and be their friend. And I see these comments in the chat, you know, we don't go there to condemn them. You know, uh, first of all, us stepping into their world is a very awkward thing because we're not like them. We don't dress like them. We don't have piercings. We don't have tattoos. We don't wearing black jackets and black clothes. And, uh, you're not doing drugs and so on. So it's very, you know, we're immediately out of place the moment we step in. You know, we're, it's like we're coming from a different culture, you know. Um, uh, so that itself is a subculture in the city. But then we go in there non judgmental, non condemning, just to be their friends, just to love them. You know, uh, that's so important. And then to talk with them, to have conversation, right? Uh, just to get to know them, uh, get to befriend them. Of course, their thought process is why is this person coming into our subculture? You know, why is this person coming here? You know, you know, uh, and so on. So there has to be, it's going to take time, but we should have the courage to enter into their world without condemning them, loving them. And then, of course, at the right time, you know, sharing about Jesus, sharing the gospel of Christ. Um, uh, and I see the other comments here from Asha. Uh, it's our selfish nature uh, that 
prevents us from getting into, you know, like for us to get into that, that subculture can be uh, uh, unnerving. It could be uncomfortable for us, you know, but then that's when that's something we have to do if you're going to reach that, that, uh, uh, that group of people. And like I see, I see, yes, I have the attitude of Christ, walk in compassion, you know. Uh, so th th that's very important. But we need to have the courage to step in. And then, of course, when you're working with them, uh, there are a lot of other things that begin to take place, meaning, you know, we've got to be able to you know, have conversations with them. We've got to understand their struggles uh, and be patient with them, continue to minister to them. But that itself is, you know, it's a big, big, a big area of work. I'm just giving one example, right? So like that, uh, we should be willing to step into people's worlds uh, as we recognize who they are and what is what is uh, what is the main thing on their minds, and then try to minister to them. Okay. So uh, next week we will continue talking about these strategies, but the key thing is this: the key thing in our strategy is how do we enter into people's worlds and meaningfully connect and meaningfully engage with them so that we can then share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, so we will talk about some practical things, how we go about doing that next week. All right, so let's wrap up today. Let's pray and uh, we will dismiss. Uh, think about these things, try to put them into action if you can, if you're already planting or pioneering a work, uh, wherever you are. Okay, any questions before you wrap up? Okay, let's pray. Can I uh, request somebody to pray? And then we will dismiss, please. For, can I pray, Pastor? Please go ahead, Pastor. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to give you glory, praise, and adoration for this moment. We thank you for all the lessons that we have been taught through Pastor Ashes. We pray that you grant us the grace, you grant us the strength, grant us the oil to be able to impact and make, uh, establish our ministries wherever we are. We pray that you cause us to adopt the various strategies that we need to expand our ministries in our various nations. We continue to pray that you grant Pastor Ashes the grace and the strength to be able to impact us for the ministries in Jesus' mighty name. We pray, Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you all on. Um,